The text you are about to listen to, by James Allen, was written in the style of its time. That is to say, in somewhat archaic English, and written by men for men. But, as Allen himself has asserted, the teachings are meant for mankind, not just for men. The material is utterly profound and life-changing, so we have taken the liberty of adapting and updating the English to make it more neutral and accessible to modern generations, male and female alike, without changing the meaning or intention of the text, and without making any copyright claims regarding our versions of his sublime works. The original versions can be found freely available online in the public domain for those who might prefer to read them in their original form. Thank you, and bless you. The Shining Gateway by James Allen He who attaineth unto purity, the faultless Parthenon of truth doth use. Awake, disperse the dreams of self and sin. Behold the Shining Gateway, enter in. Chapter 1 The Shining Gateway of Meditation be watchful, fearless, faithful, patient, pure. By earnest meditation sound the depths profound of life and scale the heights sublime of love and wisdom. Those who do not find the way of meditation cannot reach emancipation and enlightenment. The unregenerate man or woman is subject to these three things, desire, passion, and sorrow. He or she lives habitually in these conditions and neither questions nor examines them. They regard them as life itself and cannot conceive of any life apart from desire, passion, and sorrow. Today they desire, tomorrow they indulge their passions, and the third day they grieve. They are enslaved by these three things, which are always found together and don't know why they are so enslaved. The inner forces of desire and passion arise almost automatically within them, and they gratify their demands without question. Led on blindly by their blind desires, they fall periodically into the ditches of regret and unhappiness. Their condition is not only unintelligible to them, it is completely unseen, because they are so lost in the worldly desire or self-consciousness that they can't step outside of it, as it were, to examine it. To such a man or woman, the idea of rising above desire and suffering into a new life where such things don't exist seems ridiculous. He or she associates all life with the pleasurable gratification of desire, and so, by the law of reaction, they also live in the misery of suffering, shifting endlessly between pleasure and pain. When reflection dawns in the mind, there arises a sense, dim and uncertain at first, of a calmer, wiser, and higher life. And as the stages of introspection and self-analysis are reached, this sense increases in clearness and intensity, so that by the time the first three stages are fully completed, a conviction of the reality of such a life and of the possibility of reaching it is firmly fixed in the mind. Such conviction, which is made up of a single-minded belief in the supremacy of purity and goodness over desire and passion, is called faith. Such faith is the prop, support, and comfort of those of you who, while yet in darkness, are searching earnestly for the light which breaks upon you for the first time in all its dazzling splendor and ineffable majesty when you enter the shining gateway of meditation. Without such faith, you couldn't last a single day against the trials, failures, and difficulties which surround you continually, much less courageously fight and overcome them, and your final conquest and salvation would be impossible. Upon entering the stage of meditation, faith gradually ripens into knowledge, 
and the new, regenerate life begins to be realized in its quiet wisdom, calm beauty, and ordered strength, and day by day its joy and splendor increase. The final conquest over ignorance is now assured. Lust, hatred, anger, covetousness, pride and vanity, desire for pleasure, wealth and fame, worldly honor and power, all of these have become dead things, shortly to pass away forever, because there is no more life nor happiness in them. They have no part in your life as a regenerate man or woman. You know that you can never go back to them again because, now, the old of self and ignorance is dead, and the new of love and purity is born within you. You have become, or will become, as the process of meditation ripens and bears fruit, a new being, one in whom purity, love, wisdom, and peacefulness are the ruling qualities, and wherein struggles and rivalry Envies, suspicions, hatreds, and jealousies cannot find a home. Old things have passed away, and, behold, all things have become new. Men and women and things are seen in a different light, and a new universe is unveiled. There is no confusion, as out of the inner chaos of conflicting desires, passions, and sufferings, the new being arises. There arises in the outer world of apparently irreconcilable conditions a new cosmos, ordered, sequential, harmonious, ineffably glorious, faultless in equity. Meditation is a process both of purification and adjustment. Aspiration is the purifying element, and the harmonizing power resides in the intellectual train of thought involved. When the stage of meditation is reached and entered upon, two distinct processes of spiritual transmutation is reached and entered upon. Two distinct processes of spiritual transmutation begin to take place, namely, transmutation of passion and transmutation of suffering. The two conditions proceed simultaneously as they are interdependent and act and react with each other. Passion and suffering, or sin, ignorance, and affliction, are two aspects of one thing, namely the lower self, that self which is the source of all the troubles which afflict mankind. They represent power, but power wrongly used. Passion is a lower manifestation of a divine energy which possesses a higher use and application. Suffering is the limitation and neutralization of that energy and is therefore a means of restoring harmony. It says, in effect, to those who are self-bound, Thus far shalt thou go, and no further. You, the man or woman of meditation, transfer the passional energy from the realm of ignorance, self-following, to the realm of good, self-overcoming. Today you reflect, tomorrow you overcome your passion, and the third day you celebrate. The mind is awakened from its downward tendency and is directed upwards. The base metal of sin, ignorance, and error is transmuted into the pure gold of righteousness and truth. Lust, hatred, and selfishness disappear, and purity, love, and goodwill take their place. As the stage proceeds, your mind becomes more and more firmly fixed in the higher manifestations and it becomes increasingly difficult for it to think and act in the lower state. And to the degree that your mind is freed from the lower, violent and inharmonious activities, passion is transmuted into power and suffering into bliss. This means that there is no such thing as suffering to those of pure heart and mind. When ignorance is put away, suffering disappears. Selfishness is the source of suffering. Truth is the source of bliss. When the unregenerate man or woman is abused or slandered, misunderstood or persecuted, it causes them intense suffering. But when these things are aimed at you, the regenerate man or woman, the rapture of heavenly bliss arises in you. None but those who have put away the great enemy self under their feet can fully enter into and understand the saying, Blessed are ye, 
when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. And why does the righteous, regenerate man or woman rejoice under those conditions which cause such misery to those who are unrighteous or unregenerate? It's because, having overcome the ignorance within yourself, you cease to see ignorance outside of yourself. To you now all things are good, and you utilize everything for the good of the world. To you persecution is not an evil, it's a good. Having acquired insight, knowledge, and power, you, by meeting that persecution in a loving spirit, help and uplift your persecutors, and accelerate their spiritual progress, though they themselves have no idea of it at the time. In this way, you are filled with unspeakable bliss because you've conquered the forces of ignorance, because instead of succumbing to those forces, you have learned how to use and direct them for the good and the gain of mankind. You're blessed because you are at one with all of mankind, because you are reconciled to the universe and have brought yourself into harmony with the cosmic order. The following symbol will perhaps help you to more readily grasp what has been explained. There is at first the underworld of lust, darkness and death, which is associated with ignorance. Rooted in this is the foot of the cross, desire. In the body of the cross, desire branches out into two arms. The right, active or positive, are passion, being equalized and balanced by the left, passive or negative arm of affliction. Uniting these and rising out of them at the head of the cross is aspiration. Here, wounded and bleeding, rests the thorn-crowned head of humanity. At the end of this, and right at the summit of the cross, is knowledge, which, while being at the apex of the self-life, is the base of the truth life, and above rises the heavenly world of love, light, and life. You, the regenerate man or woman, live in this supremely beautiful world, even while living on this earth. You have reached Nirvana, the kingdom of heaven. You've taken up your cross, and there is no more ignorance, and suffering, desire, and passion and affliction are passed away. Harmony is restored, and all is bliss and peace. The cross is the symbol of pain. Desire is painful. Passion is painful. Suffering is painful. And aspiration is painful. This is why these things are symbolized by a cross which has two pairs of conflicting poles. Suffering is the harmonizing and purifying element in passion. Aspiration is the harmonizing and purifying element in desire. Where the one is, the other must also be. Take away the one, and the other disappears. Suffering, or affliction, is necessary to counteract passion. Aspiration, or prayer, is necessary to purge away desire. But all these things are ended for you, the regenerate man or woman. You have risen into a new life and a new order of things. The consciousness of purity, lacking nothing and being at one with all things, you do not need to pray for anything. Redeemed and reconciled, contented and at peace, you find nothing in the universe to hate or fear. And the duty and the power to work without ceasing is yours, both for the present good and the ultimate salvation of mankind. Chapter 2 Temptation I know that sorrow follows passion. Know that grief and emptiness and heartache wait upon all earthly joys. So am I sad. Yet truth must be, and being can be found. And although I am in sorrow, this I know. I shall be glad when I have found the truth. Mankind's only external tempters are the objects of sensation, or worldly things. These, however, are powerless in themselves until they are reflected in your mind as desirable objects to possess. Your only enemy, therefore, is your craving for and coveting of the objects of sensation of worldly things. 
by ceasing to lust after objects of sensation, temptation and the painful fighting against impure desires fall away. This ceasing to lust after worldly things is called the relinquishing of worldly desire. It is the renunciation of the inner defilement or corruption, by which a man or woman stops being the slave of outward things and becomes their master. Temptation is a growth, a process more or less slow, the duration of which can be measured by you, the sage, who has gained accurate knowledge of the nature of your thoughts and acts and the laws governing them, by virtue of having subjected yourself to a long course of training in mental discipline and self-control. It has five stages which can be clearly defined, and their development traced with precision. But, as one who is still hypnotized by temptation, you have, as yet, little or no knowledge of the nature of your thoughts and acts and the laws governing them. You have lived so long in outward worldly things, in the worldly objects of sensation, and have given so little time to introspection and the cleansing of your heart, that you live in almost total ignorance of the real nature of your thoughts and the acts which you think and commit every day. To you, temptation seems to be instantaneous, and your powerlessness to combat the sudden and apparent unaccountable onslaught causes you to regard it as a mystery. And, mystery being the mother of superstition, you may and usually do fall back upon some speculative belief to account for your trouble, such as the belief in an invisible evil being or power outside yourself who, suddenly and without warning, attacks and torments you. Such a superstition renders you more powerless still, because you have enough knowledge to understand that you cannot hope to successfully cope with a being more powerful than yourself, and of whose whereabouts and tactics you are completely unaware of. And so, you introduce other beliefs and superstitions, which your dilemma seems to necessitate, until, eventually, in addition to all of your ignorance and suffering, you become burdened with a mass of supernatural beliefs which hold your attention captive and take you further and further away from the real cause of your difficulty. Meanwhile, you continue to be tempted and to fall, and must do so until by self-subjugation and self-purification you have acquired the ability to trace the relation between cause and effect in your spiritual nature, when, with purified and enlightened vision, you will see that the moment of temptation is but the fulfillment of those impure desires which you secretly harbor in your own heart. And, later, with a still purer heart, and when you have gained sufficient control over your wandering thoughts to be able to analyze and understand them, you will see that the actual moment of temptation itself has its birth, its growth, and its fruition. What, then, are the stages in temptation? And how is the process of temptation born in the mind? How does it grow and bear its bitter fruit? There are five stages and are as follows. 1. Perception 2. Consideration 3. Conception 4. Attraction and 5. Desire the first stage is that in which worldly objects of sensation are simply perceived as objects. This is pure naked perception and is without ignorance or defilement or conceptualization. The second stage is that in which worldly objects of sensation are considered as objects of personal pleasure. This is the mind focusing and contemplating upon objects with an undefined groping for pleasurable sensation and is the beginning of defilement and ignorance. In the third stage, objects of sensation are conceived as objects of pleasure. In this stage, the objects are associated with certain pleasurable sensations, and these sensations are conceived and called up vividly in the mind. In the fourth stage, worldly objects of sensation are perceived as objects of pleasure. In this stage, the pleasure being connected with the object is distinctly defined, yet there is a confusion of pleasure and object, so that the two seem to be the same thing, and a wish to possess the object appears in the mind. There is also a going out of the mind towards the object. 
The fifth and last stage is an intense desire, an urging, a coveting and a lusting to possess the object in order to experience the pleasure and gratification which it will bring. With every repetition of the first four stages in the mind, this desire is added to as fuel is added to fire, and it increases in intensity and eagerness until, eventually, your whole being is aflame with a burning passion which is blind to everything but its own immediate pleasure and gratification. And when this painful realization of thought is reached, you are said to be tempted. There is still a further stage of action, which is simply the doing of the thing desired, the manifestation of the ignorance already committed in the mind. From desire to action is just a short step. The following table will better enable your mind to grasp the process and principle involved. Inaction, stillness of mind, holiness, rest. 1. Perception. Worldly objects of sensation perceived simply as such. 2. Consideration. Worldly objects of sensation considered as a source of pleasure. 3. Conception. Worldly objects of sensation conceived as affording pleasure. 4. Attraction. Worldly objects of sensation perceived as pleasurable in possession. 5. Desire. Worldly objects of sensation coveted as such, craved for personal delight and pleasure. Action, sin, ignorance, unrest. Every time you are tempted, you pass from inaction through all the five stages in succession and your fall is the passing on into action. The process varies greatly in duration according to the nature of the temptation and the character of the tempted. But after much giving in to the temptation and after many falls, the mind becomes so familiar with the transition that it passes through all the stages so fast as to make the temptation appear as an instantaneous, indivisible experience. As a sage, however, you never lose sight of the duration of time occupied in the process of temptation, but you watch its growth and transition. And just as the scientist can measure the time occupied in the transition of sensation from the brain to the bodily extremities, or from the extremities to the brain, which ordinarily appears not to occupy duration, so you measure, though by a different method, the passage from pure perception to inflamed desire in a sudden experience of temptation. This knowledge of the nature of temptation destroys its power, or rather, its apparent power, because power only exists in holiness. Ignorance is at the root of all temptation, and it fades away when knowledge is admitted into the mind, just as darkness and the effects of darkness disappear when light is introduced. So ignorance and its effects are scattered when knowledge of one's spiritual nature is acquired and embraced. How do you avoid ignorance and remain in peace then? Knowing the nature of ignorant acts, how they are the result of temptation, also knowing the nature of temptation, how it is the end and materialization of a particular train of thought, you cut off that train of thought at its first appearance, not allowing your mind to go out into the world of sensation, which is the world of pain and sorrow. You stand over your mind, eternally vigilant, and do not allow your thoughts to pass beyond the safe gates of pure perception. To you, all things are pure, because your mind is pure. You see all worldly objects, whether material or mental, as they are, and not as the pleasure seeker sees them, as objects of personal enjoyment, nor as the tempted one sees them, as sources of ignorance and pain. Your normal sphere, however, is that of inaction and mental stillness, which is perfect holiness and rest. This is a position of entire indifference to considerations of pleasure and pain regarding all things from the standpoint of right and not from that of enjoyment. Are you, the pure-minded one then, 
deprived of all enjoyment? Is your life a dead monotony of inaction and inertia? Actually, you are delivered from all those sensory excitements which the world calls pleasure, but which hides as a mask the strained features of pain. And, being released from the bondage of cravings and pleasures, you live permanently in the divine, abiding joy which the pleasure seeker and the wanderer in ignorance can neither know nor understand. But inaction, in this particular, means inaction as regards to ignorance or sin, inaction in the lower animal activities which, being cut off, their energy is transferred to the higher intellectual and righteous activities, releasing their power and giving them unrestricted scope and freedom. In this way, you, the sage, avoid ignorance by extracting its root within yourself, not allowing it to grow into attraction, to blossom into desire, and to bear the bitter fruits of sinful or ignorant actions. The unwise, however, allow the thought of pleasure to take root in their mind, where its growth evokes sensations which are pleasant to them, and on these sensations he or she stays with the enjoyment, thinking in their heart, as long as I don't commit the ignorant act, I am free from ignorance. They don't realize that their thoughts are causes, the effects of which are actions, and that there is no escape from sinful ignorant acts for those who remain in sinful ignorant thoughts. And so the process develops in their mind and blossoms into desire, and in the final moment of temptation, which is but the moment of opportunity brought into manifestation by that desire, with the lusted after object at their unconditional command, the fall of the man or woman into sinful or ignorant action is swift and certain. Chapter 3. Regeneration Submit to naught but nobleness. Rejoice like a strong athlete straining for the prize when thy full strength is tried. Be not the slave of lusts and cravings and indulgences, of disappointments, miseries and griefs, fears, doubts and lamentations. But control thyself with calmness. Master that in thee which masters others and which heretofore has mastered thee. Let not thy passions rule, but rule thy passions. Subjugate thyself until passion is transmuted into peace, and wisdom crown thee. So shalt thou attain, and by attaining, no. Having considered and examined the nature of temptation in its five interdependent stages, let us now turn to the process of regeneration, and also consider its nature, so that you, the hearer of the word, who has already received some measure of enlightenment, may be still further guided in your strenuous climbing towards the perfect life. The five stages in regeneration, already enumerated, are 1. Reflection 2. Introspection 3. Self-analysis 4. Meditation and 5. Pure Perception The first stage in a pure and true life is that of thoughtfulness. The thoughtless cannot enter the right way in life. Only the reflective mind can acquire wisdom. When you cease to go after enjoyment and bring yourself to a standstill in order to examine your position and to reflect upon the condition of the world and the meaning of life, then you have entered upon the first stage of regeneration. When you begin to think seriously and with a deep and noble purpose in view, you have stepped out of the broad way where the thoughtless and the frivolous clutch at the bubbles of pleasure and have entered the narrow way where the thoughtful and the wise comprehend eternal truth. Your liberation from ignorance and suffering is already assured. Although you are, as yet, surrounded by much uncertainty, you are already realizing a foretaste of the peace which awaits you. Your passions, though still strong, are quieter your mind is calmer and clearer. Your dealing with others is purer and graver. And in your moments of deepest thought, you see, as in a vision, 
the strength and calmness and wisdom which you know will one day be your well-earned possessions. In this way, you pass on to the second stage. Reflecting day by day, with ever-increasing earnestness upon life in all its phases, you come to perceive the passions and desires in which mankind is involved, and realize the sorrows which are connected with their strangely ephemeral existence. You see the burning fevers of lusts and ambitions and craving for pleasures, and the chilling undercurrents of anxieties and fears, and the uncertainty of slowly approaching death. And you aspire to know the meaning of it all, are eager to find the source and cause of that which seems so sorrowful and inexplicable. Recognizing yourself as a unit in humanity, as one involved in like passions and sorrows with all other men and women, you vaguely understand that somehow the secret of all life is inevitably bound up with the neophyte, with mind purified, calmed, and your own existence. And so, unsatisfied with the surface theories which are based on observation only, and which still leave you subject to passions and sorrows and the prey of anxieties and fears, you turn your thoughts inwardly upon your own mind, thinking perhaps that the wished-for revelation of wisdom and peace is waiting for you there. And so you become introspective. And so you pass on to the third stage. When the habit of introspection, of watching your own thoughts, is fully ripened and acquired, a subtle process of inductive thought is called up in the mind by the aid of which the innermost recesses of your nature, and, therefore, of all humanity, begin to reveal themselves and yield up their secrets to the penetrating insights of you, the patient searcher who, unraveling now the tangled threads of thought and tracing out the warp and woof of the web of life as it is woven in the mental processes and by the swift flying shuttle of thought, begin for the first time to somewhat clearly comprehend the inner causes of human deeds and the meaning and the purpose of existence. As this process of thought is proceeded with, the desires and passions are purified away from your mind, the calmness necessary to a right perception of truth is acquired, and gradually the fixed principles of things are presented to the comprehension and the eternal laws of life are coherently grasped by the understanding. And now, quietly and almost as imperceptibly as the soft light of dawn stealing upon the sleeping world, controlled, you pass into the fourth stage and you open your long sleeping eyes upon the rising light of truth. You become habitually meditative, and in meditation you find the master key which unlocks the door of knowledge. It is at this advanced stage in the process of regeneration that the sinner becomes the saint and the pupil is transformed into the master. For here the process of transmutation, up to now slow and painful, is greatly accelerated so that the spiritual forces formerly spent in pleasures, gratifications, passions, and afflictions are now conserved, controlled, and turned into channels of productive and reproductive thought. And so wisdom is born in the mind, and bliss, and peace. As skill and power are acquired in meditation, the fifth and last stage is reached where the perfect insight of the seer and the sage is evolved, so that the facts of life are grasped and the laws and principles of things stand revealed. Here you are altogether regenerated, are purified and perfected. All human passions are conquered and human sorrows transcended. Here things are seen as they are, and the intricacies of life stand out naked in the light of truth. And there is no more doubt and perplexity no more ignorance and anguish. Your pure and enlightened eyes perceive the hidden causes and effects which operate infallibly in human life. You know how the bitter fruits of passion ripen and where the dark waters of sorrow spring. For you there are no more sins and no more sorrows. See, you have come to peace. The five stages so passed through may be presented in the following way. Ignorance, 
sin, and suffering. 1. Reflection Deep and earnest thought on the nature and meaning of life. 2. Introspection Looking inwardly for the causes and effects which operate in life. 3. Self-analysis Searching the springs of thought and purifying the motives in order to find the truth of life. 4. Meditation Pure and discriminative thought on the facts and principles of life. 5. Pure perception, insight, direct knowledge of the laws of life, enlightenment, purity, peace. The whole process of regeneration may be likened to the growth of a plant. At first, the small seed of reflection is cast into the dark soil of ignorance. Then, the little rootlets come forth and grope about for light and sustenance, introspection. Next, the strenuous self-examination is as the plant reaching upward towards the light, and then the development of the bud and opening flower of meditation, ending, at last, in that pure and wise insight which is the spiritual glory of the sage, the perfect flower of enlightenment. In this way, beginning in ignorance and suffering, and passing through thoughtfulness, self-searching, self-purification, meditation and insight, the seeker after the pure life and the divine wisdom reaches at last the undented habitation of a spotless life and so passes beyond the dark halls of suffering, knowing the perfect law. Chapter 4 Actions and Motives Obey the right, and wrong shall ne'er again assail thy peace, nor error hurt thee more. Attune thy heart to purity, and thou shalt reach the place where sorrow is not, and all evil ends. It has been said that the way to hell is paved with good intentions, and one frequently hears ignorance accused on the ground that it was done with a good motive. There are actions which are bad in themselves, and there are actions which are good in themselves, and good actions cannot make bad actions good. Selfish intentions cannot make good actions bad. Foremost among actions which are bad in themselves are those which are classified as criminal by all civilized communities. So murder, theft, adultery, libel, etc. are always bad and it isn't necessary to inquire into the motive which prompts them. Black and white remain black and white to all eternity, and are not altered by misleading or deceptive lines of reasoning. A lie is eternally a lie, and no number of good intentions can turn it into a truth. If you tell a lie with a good intention, you have nonetheless uttered a lie. If you speak the truth with a selfish intention, you have nonetheless spoken the truth. Beside those actions mentioned above, there are others which, while not classified by the law of the land as criminal, are yet recognized as wrong by nearly all intelligent people. Actions pertaining to social and family life and to our everyday relations with our fellow men. Thus, when a child willfully violates its duty to its parents, the father doesn't stop to inquire into the motives of the child but meets out the due correction, because the act of disobedience is wrong in itself. Now you may ask here, in being taught then to regard the motive, the condition of heart, as all-important, and the act itself as secondary, have we been taught wrongly? No, you have not. The motive is all-important, for it determines the nature of the act, and here we must distinguish between intentions and motives. When people speak of good and bad motives, they nearly always mean good or bad intentions. That is, the action is done with a certain good or bad objective in view. The motive is the deeply seated cause in the mind, the habitual condition of heart. The intention is the purpose in view. So an act or an action may spring from an impure motive, yet be done with the best intention. 
It is possible for you to be involved in wrong motives, and yet at the same time be so charged with good intentions as to be continually intruding yourself on other people, and interfering in their business and their lives under the delusion that they need your help. Intentions are more or less superficial and are largely matters of impulse, while motives are more deeply seated and are concerned with your fixed moral condition. You may do an action today with a good intention and in a few weeks' time do the same action with a bad intention, but in both cases the motive underlying the action will be the same. In reality, a wrong act can't spring from a right motive, although it may be guided by a good intention. A man or woman who can resort, whether habitually or under stress of temptation, to murder, theft, lying, or other actions known as bad, is in a dark, confused condition of mind and is not capable of acting from right motives. Such acts can only spring from an impure source, and this is why the great teachers rarely refer to motives, but always refer to actions. In the teacher's precepts, they tell us what actions are bad and what are good, without any reference to motive. For the bad and good acts in themselves are the fruits of bad and good motives. By their fruits you shall know them. In being strongly advised to judge not, we are not taught to persuade ourselves that grapes are figs and figs grapes but must employ our judgment in clearly distinguishing between the two. So, in the same way, we must distinguish with unmistakable clearness between bad actions and good actions, so as to avoid the former and embrace the latter. Because only in this way can you purify your heart and render yourself capable of acting from right motives. A clear perception of what is bad or good, both in ourselves and in others, is not false judgment, it's wisdom. It's only when you harbor groundless suspicion about others and read bad and selfish intentions into their actions that you actually fall into that judging against which we are warned and which is so detrimental. There is no need to doubt the good intentions of those about us, while at the same time being fully alive to a knowledge of those bad actions which were better left undone and those good actions which are better done taking care not to do the former and to do the latter ourselves, so teaching by our lives, instead of accusing and condemning others. Numberless wrong actions are committed every day with good intentions, and this is why so many good purposes are frustrated and end in disappointment, because the underlying motive is impure, and the good fruit which is wanted doesn't appear. The act is out of harmony with the good intent. The means are not adapted to the end. Bad actions bring forth bitter fruit. Good actions bring forth sweet fruit. The law runs, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Not, Thou shalt not kill, steal, or commit adultery with a bad motive. Wrong actions are always accompanied with self-delusion, and the chief form which such self-delusion assumes is that of self-justification. If you flatter yourself that you can commit a sinful, ignorant act and yet be free from ignorance because you are prompted by a pure motive, then no limit can be set to the evil which you may commit. It will be found that bad actions, in the majority of instances, are accompanied with good intentions. Your objective as a slanderer, generally, is to protect your fellow men from one another. Troubled with foolish suspicions or distressing under the thought of injury, you warn men and women against each other, speaking only of their bad qualities, and, in your eagerness, distort the truth. Your intention is good, namely to protect your neighbors, but your motive is bad, namely hatred of those whom you slander. Your good intention is frustrated by your bad action, and you eventually only succeed in separating yourself from all truth-loving people. The sore of a bad action is not cured by plastering it over with good intentions. 
nor is the cause of the defilement or corruption removed from the heart. Those who are involved in bad actions cannot work from pure motives. An issue of foul water always comes from an impure source, and an issue of impure actions proceeds from a heart that is defiled or corrupted. It greatly simplifies life and solves all complex problems of conduct when certain actions are recognized as eternally bad and others as eternally good, and the bad are forever abandoned and final refuge is taken in the good. As one of the wise and good, you perform only good actions, and motive, action, and intention being harmoniously adjusted, your life is powerful for good and free from disappointment, and the good fruit of your efforts appear in due season. You don't need to defend your actions by subtle and deceptive arguments, nor do you need to enter into interminable metaphysical speculations concerning motives, but are content to act and to leave your actions to bear their own fruit. Let's not try to persuade ourselves that our good intentions will wipe out the results of our bad actions, but let's resort to the practice of good actions, because only in this way can we acquire goodness. Only in this way can the life be established on fixed principles, and the mind be rendered capable of comprehending and working from pure motives. Chapter 5. Morality and Religion The wise man or woman, by adding thought to thought and deed to deed, in ways of good buildeth their character. Little by little he or she accomplishes their noble ends in quiet patience, works diligently. Daily he or she builds into their heart and mind pure thoughts, high aspirations, selfless deeds, until at last the edifice of truth is finished, and, behold, there rises and appears the temple of perfection. There is no surer indication of confusion and decadence in spiritual matters than the severance of morality from religion. He is a highly moral man, but he is not religious. He is exceptionally good and virtuous, but is not at all spiritual are common expressions on the lips of many people who thus regard religion as something quite distinct from goodness, purity, and right living. If religion be regarded merely and only as worship combined with adherence to a particular form of faith, then it would be correct to say, he is a very good man but is not religious. In some instances, just as it would be equally correct to say, he is an immoral man but is very religious in other instances, because murderers, thieves, and other evildoers are sometimes devout worshippers and zealous adherents to a doctrine, religion, or ideology. Such a narrowing down of religion, however, would render much of the Sermon on the Mount superfluous from a religious point of view, and would lead to the confusing of the means of religion with its end, the idolizing of the letter of religion to the exclusion of the spirit. And this is what actually occurs when morality is severed from religion and is regarded as something alien and distinct from it. Religion, however, has a broader significance than this, and the most obscure doctrine embodies in its ritual some longing human cry for that goodness, that virtue, that righteousness, which many, with thoughtless judgment, divorce from religion. And isn't a life of righteous excellence, of good and noble character, of pure-heartedness, the very end and purpose of religion? Isn't it the substance and spirit of which worship and adherence to a form of faith are but the shadow and the letter? In religion, as in other things, there are the means and the end, the methods and the attainment. Worship, beliefs about God, adherence to creeds, these are some of the means. Goodness, virtue, righteousness, these are the end. The methods or means are many and various, and they are embodied in countless forms of faith. But the end is one. It is righteous grandeur. In this way, you, as one of the righteous, far from being irreligious because you may not openly profess some form of worship, possess the substance of religion, have diffused its spirit, 
have attained its end, and when the sweet kernel of religion is found and enjoyed, the shell, protective and necessary in its place, has served its purpose and may be dispensed with. Don't let this be misunderstood, though. The righteous man or woman doesn't refer to one who only has the outward form of righteousness, appearing moral in the eyes of the world but keeping their vices secret. Nor does it refer to one whose righteousness extends only to legal limits, nor to those who are proud of their righteousness, as pride is the opposite of righteous. It refers to those who delight in purity, who are gracious, gentle, unselfish and thoughtful, who, being good at heart, pour out the fragrance of pure thoughts and good deeds. By the righteous is meant the good, the pure, the noble, and the true and pure-hearted. You may call yourself a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Mohammedan, a Hindu, or by any other name, and be unrighteous. But if you are of pure heart and mind, if you are true and noble and beautiful in character, in a word, if you are righteous, then you are an inhabitant of the holy city in which there is no temple. You are, by example and influence, a regenerator of mankind. You are one of the company of the children of the light. Chapter 6 Memory, Repetition, and Habit I shall gain, by purity and strong self-mastery, the awakened vision that doth set men free from painful slumber and the night of grief. When a particular combination of words has been repeated a number of times, it is said to have been committed to memory. That is, it can then be repeated without visual reference to the words themselves, and without pause or effort. Indeed, the words then have a tendency to repeat themselves in the mind, and sometimes people are troubled with the echoing of a song or the repetition of a sentence in the mind, which they find it very difficult to get rid of and forget. There is a sense in which the whole of life is a process of committing to memory. At first there is act or action, and from action springs experience. From experience comes recollection. From recollection comes repetition. And from repetition, habits are formed. And from there comes impulse, faculty, character, and individualized existence. Life is a repetition of the same things over and over again. There is very little difference between the days and years in your life. One is almost entirely a repetition of the other. Every being is an accumulation of experiences gathered, learned, and woven into the life by a ceaseless series of repetitions extending over an incalculable number of lives which thread their way through eons of time. Your life, from the germ cell to maturity, is a repetition, in synthesis, of the entire process of evolution. There is a cosmic memory at the root of all growth and progress, which is an informing and sustaining principle in the process of evolution. Your sensuous memory is fickle and short-lived, but the supersensuous memory, which is inherent in all matter, building up forms and faculty, is infallible in its reproduction of experiences. Life is endless reiteration. Nature ever travels old and familiar ground. You are daily repeating what you've learned, though. The schools of experience in which the lessons were acquired may be long forgotten, but the acquired habit is not forgotten. It is carried forward and continues to act. The unconscious and automatic ease which marks a well-established habit is not the ready-made mechanism of a frivolous creator. It is a skill acquired by practice. It is the achievement and fulfillment of millions of repetitions of the same thought and act. Thoughts and deeds repeated over and over again eventually become spontaneous and unconscious impulses. It's a profound truth that there is nothing new under the sun. It is possible and highly probable that in the round of eternity, 
Even all our modern inventions and mechanical marvels have been produced countless times on this or other worlds. In this world, new combinations of matter appear from time to time, but are they new in the universe? Who dare say that, in the mind which overarches eternity, the cosmic memory isn't reproducing things fashioned out of itself eons ago? Nothing can be added to or taken from the universe. Its matter can neither be increased nor decreased. Chemical combinations of matter vary, but matter itself cannot vary. Life, likewise, does not change. In the forms of life there is continuous flux, but in the principle of life there is no increase or reduction or weakening. Forms appear only to retreat and disappear, but what disappears isn't lost. The memory of it is retained, and it continues to be repeated. Eternal disintegration is balanced by eternal restitution. Your mind is not separate from the eternal mind. The records of all its past is indelibly written in its daily repetitions. Character is an accumulation of deeds. You are the last reckoning in the long sum of evolution, and there is no falsification of the account. The mind continues to automatically perform the habit which encloses a million repetitions of the same deed. Compared with this indelible unconscious memory, the memory of a nominal span of a human life is as a fading vapor to an Egyptian pyramid. The tendencies, impulses, and habits of which you are a victim are the repetitions of your accumulated deeds. They enfold the destiny which you have created. The grace goodness and genius which you exhibit without conscious effort are the fruits of the accumulated labors of your mind. That which was learned by painful labor you now repeat with ease. The wise see a reflection of themselves in the fate which overtakes them. Life flows in channels, and every man or woman is in a rut. We tell our fellows to get out of their ruts, but we ourselves are in ruts of another kind. The flow of law, of nature, cannot be avoided, but it can be utilized. We cannot avoid ruts, but we can avoid bad ones, and we can follow along good ones. In their training and education, the children of today are strictly confined to ways which are worn by the feet of a thousand generations. In your fixed habits and characteristics, you, today, or reviving the actions of a thousand lives. It is true that you are bound, but it is equally true that you can unbind yourself. The law by which you become the sorrowful victim of your own wrong deeds is a blessed and not a cursed law, because by the same law you can become the instrument of all that is good. Habits chain you, but you yourself forged the links. You whose inner eye has opened to perceive the law, do not complain. The bondage of evil is a heavy slavery, but the bondage of good is a blessed service. Your will is powerless to alter the law of life, but it is powerful to obey it. The great law makes for good. It puts a heavy penalty on evil or ignorance. You can break your chains and shake yourself free, and when you enter earnestly upon the work of self-liberation, all the universe will be with you in your labor. You cannot avoid repetition and habit, but you can set going repetitions that are harmonious. You can form habits that will crystallize into pure and noble characteristics. The entire records of mankind's evolution are stored away in the self-built archives of the mind. You are an epitomized history of the world. In your outbursts of rage, we hear again the roar of the lion in the forest. In your selfish schemings to secure your craved and coveted ends, we see the tiger stalking its prey. Your lusts, revenges, hatreds, and fears are the instinct born of primeval experience. The universe does not forget. Life remembers and restores. Between the sensuous and the supersensuous worlds, 
is the Lethean stream, the river of forgetfulness. Only those who have passed into the supersensuous world, the world of pure goodness, remember with the memory of life which transcends a million deaths. Only those whose will obeys the universal will, whose heart is in harmony with the cosmic order, receive the vision which pierces through the veil of time and matter and sees the before and the beyond. We quickly forget, and it is well that we forget. The universe remembers and records. The repetition of an evil or an ignorant deed is its own retribution. The repetition of a good deed is its own reward. The deepest punishment of evil is evil, and the highest reward of good is good. When a deed is done, it is not ended. It is but begun. It remains with the doer to curse him if evil, or to bless him if good. Deeds accumulate by repetition, and they remain as character, and in character is both curse and blessing. Suffering inheres in the discordant repetition of evil. Bliss inheres in the rhythmic repetitions of good. Seeing that we cannot escape the law of repetition, let us choose to do those things which are good, and as you establish habits of purity, the divine memory will be awakened within you. Chapter 7 Words and Wisdom I would find where wisdom is, where peace abides, where truth, majestic, changeless, and eternal, stands untouched by the illusions of the world. For surely there is knowledge, truth, and peace for him who seeks. Thoughts, words, actions, these combine to make up the entire life of every individual. Words and actions are thoughts expressed. We think in words. In the process of thinking, words are stored up in the consciousness, where they await expression and use as occasion may call them forth. Words fit the mind which receives them. They are the tally of the intellect which uses them. The meaner the mind, the more meager is the vocabulary. A limited and a capacious intellect alike expresses itself through a limited and an extensive use of words. A great mind expresses itself by the vehicle of flowing and noble language. Words stand for conceptions. Conceptions are embodied in words. At the moment that a conception is formed in the mind, its corresponding word arises in the thought. Conceptions and words cannot be hidden away indefinitely. Sooner or later they will come forth into the outer world of expression. The matter of the universe is in ceaseless circulation. Its hidden things are continuously coming forth into open and visible life. Likewise, the mental operations of mankind are ever in active circulation, and their hidden thoughts are daily expressing themselves in words and actions. The words and actions of every man and woman are determined by the thoughts in which he or she habitually dwells. Speech is audible thought. You reveal yourself through your speech. Whether you are pure or impure, foolish or vice, you make your inner condition known through your speech. The foolish are known by the way in which they talk. The wise are known by the purity, gravity, and excellence of their speech. He who would gain a knowledge of men, says Confucius, must first learn to understand the meaning of words. All wise men and women, saints and great teachers, have declared that the first step in wisdom is to control the tongue. The discipline of speech is a mental discipline. When you control your tongue, you control your mind. When you purify your speech, you purify your mind. Speech and mind cannot be separated. They are two aspects of character. You may read scripture, study religions, and practice mystical arts, but if you allow your tongue to run loosely, you will be as foolish at the end of all your labors as you were at the beginning. You may not read scripture, nor study religions, 
nor practice aesthetic arts. But if you control your tongue and study how to speak wisely and well, you will become wise. Wisdom is perceived in the words which are its expression. We speak of certain men, of Shakespeare, for instance, as being wise. We never saw Shakespeare, and we know very little of his life. How then do we know he was wise? By his words only. Where there are wise words, we know there is a wise mind. A fool may, like a parrot, repeat wise words, but the wise frame wise sentences. Their wisdom is shown in originally expressed language. Why do we speak of words being bad or good, degrading or inspiring, low or lofty, weak or strong? Isn't it because we unconsciously recognize that words cannot be disassociated from thoughts? Why do pure-minded people avoid a man or woman who habitually uses impure language? Isn't it because they know that such words proceed from an unclean mind? It is impossible for anyone to give utterance to words which are not already lodged in their mind in the form of thought. The impure mind cannot speak pure words. The pure mind cannot speak impure words. The ignorant cannot speak learnedly, nor the learned ignorantly. The foolish cannot speak wisely, nor the wise foolishly. Altered speech follows an altered mind. When you turn from evil to good, your conversation becomes cleansed. As you increase in wisdom, you watch, modify, and perfect your speech. If the foolish and the wise are known by their words, what, then, is the speech of foolishness, and what the language of wisdom? You are foolish if you talk aimlessly and incoherently, if you engage in impure conversations, if you utter falsehoods and lies, if you speak ill of the absent and carry about malicious reports concerning others, if you frame flattering words, if you utter violent and abusive words, if your speech is irreverent and your words are directed against the great and good, if you speak in praise of yourself. You are wise if you talk with purpose and intelligence, if your conversation is pure and incorrupt, if you utter words of sincerity and truth, if you speak well of and in defense of the absent, if you speak words of virtuous reproof, if your speech is gentle and kindly, if you talk reverently of the great and good, if you speak in praise of others. We are all, now and always, justified and condemned by our words. The law of truth is not held in suspension, and every day is judgment day. For every idle word which one speaks, you are at once called to account and an immediate and certain loss of happiness and influence. By the words which we habitually utter, we publish to the universe the degree of our intelligence and the standard of our righteousness, and receive back through them the judgment of the world. The fool thinks they are harshly judged and badly treated by others, not knowing that their real curse is their own ungoverned tongue. To control the tongue to discipline the speech, to strive for the use of purer and gentler words. This is a very lowly thing, and one that is much despised, but it cannot be neglected by those who eagerly aspire to walk the way of wisdom. Chapter 8 Truth Made Manifest Upon the lofty summits of the truth, where clouds and darkness are not, and where rests eternal splendor, there abiding joy awaits thy coming. Be watchful, fearless, faithful, patient, pure. By earnest meditation sound the depths profound of life, and scale the heights sublime of love and wisdom. Truth is rendered visible through the media of deeds. It is something seen and not heard. 
Words don't contain the truth, they only symbolize it. Good deeds are the only vessels which contain truth. It has been frequently said that being must precede doing. Being always does precede doing, but being and doing cannot be swiftly separated. Your deeds are your expression. Actions are the language of reality. If your inner being is allied to truth, your deeds will speak it forth. If your inner being is allied to ignorance, your deeds will make manifest that ignorance. You cannot hide what you are. You must necessarily act, and every time you act, you reveal yourself. In the light of reality, you cannot deceive humanity or the universe, but you can deceive yourself. Deeds of purity, love, gentleness, patience, humility, compassion and wisdom are truth made manifest. These qualities are life itself and cannot be contained within the covers of a book, but only the words which refer to them. Deeds of impurity, hatred, anger, pride, vanity and foolishness are error and ignorance making itself known. Your deeds are the publication of yourself to the world. Truth cannot be comprehended through reading, but only by correcting and converting yourself. Precepts are aids to the acquirement of wisdom, but wisdom is only acquired by practice. If you want to know what measure of truth you possess, you should ask yourself, what am I? What are my deeds? We argue about words thinking that truth is heard and read. Truth is neither heard nor read, it is seen. Good deeds are the visible embodiments of truth. They are messengers of knowledge, angels of wisdom. But the eye of error and ignorance is dark and cannot see them. Chapter 9 Spiritual Humility Who would be the companion of the wise and know the cosmic splendor? He must stoop who seeks to stand, must fall who fain would rise, must know the low ascending to the high. He who would know the great must not disdain to diligently wait upon the small. He wisdom finds who finds humility. Throughout the sacred scriptures of all religions, there runs, like a silver thread, the teaching of humility. Not only all the scriptures, but the sages of all time have declared that only through the portal of humility is it possible for you to enter into the possession of the life of truth. And as that life is entirely of a spiritual nature, so the humility that leads to it is purely and absolutely spiritual. And being such, it can never be materialized, can never be embodied in a dogma or laid down as a formula. It is not an outward thing, nor does it consist of that practice of self-degradation that has hijacked its name. But priests have taught, and many have been led to believe, that self-depreciation is true humility. While in reality, it is its extreme antithesis Self-depreciation is self-degradation. In a fashion, it's even a sort of self-destruction. It is spiritual suicide. If you believe that all your righteousness is as filthy rags, that there is no good thing in you, and that you can never rise by any effort of your own, is by that very attitude of your mind rendering yourself impotent. You are strangling the spirit. You are undermining and disintegrating all that is highest and noblest in your character. Instead of building up your character, you are engaged in despoiling it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What our thoughts are, such are our characters. We are in reality beings composed of thoughts. Thoughts are the bricks which we are continually laying down in the building of our souls. If we put a large percentage of rotten bricks into the building, we shall build but a miserable hovel. 
and every self-depreciating thought is a brick that is already crumbling. It will be found to be a rule marvelously accurate in its application that those who continually live in this attitude of self-depreciation are, throughout life, or at any rate, until they strike a nobler attitude, wretched failures. I can bring to my mind many such men and women that I have known. How can it be otherwise? How can you ever win the confidence of others or accomplish anything worthy if you have no faith in yourself? Besides, such a man and woman has not, cannot possibly have any faith in human nature. Despising themselves, they despise all. And as a result, by the unerring law of cause and effect, all others despise them. Yet it is a strange fact that the men and women who maintain this faith-destroying attitude of mind invariably profess to have the greatest faith in God. Indeed, they look upon it as an infallible witness to their superior spiritual faith. But I ask this question. Doesn't true faith, like true charity, begin at home? In the growth of the soul, faith in oneself comes first, next faith in human nature, and finally faith in God. That faith which professes to have the faith in God, but not faith in oneself and of nature, is a false faith, the outcome of which is fake humility. Another kind of false humility is that of personal degradation to an individual or to an established authority. This is humility materialized or subverted. It is the worship of Dagon, the bowing of the knee to Baal, the slavish adoration of the golden calf. No man or woman can persist in it without undermining their character and ultimately dissipating their spiritual and mental energies. Humility to other men and women or to any temporal authority is degrading and slavish. Humility to the Most High is grandly beautiful. Spiritual humility is closely allied to faith, and the more there is of humility, the more there is of faith. It is the keynote of all real greatness. In proof of this, I have only to refer to the great sages, saints, and reformers of all time. The greatest of them are those who had the greatest share of spiritual humility. True humility as distinguished from false, has a strengthening power, an upbuilding force. It inspires and invigorates the soul, spurring it on to greater and ever greater endeavor. Of what does this humility consist, then? Is it the bending of the knee to ask personal favors of deity? Is it the blind demanding that God accomplish our petty and narrow designs for us? No. These are its counterfeits. True humility is far above and beyond all this. It is the deepest and holiest aspiration of the human heart, where deep within, hidden from all sacrilegious gaze, it works a silent, mighty power, purifying, transforming the man or woman of flesh and self. Entering its solitary grandeur, the alienated soul returns to the footstool of its God and bathes in blissful rapture in the light of his all-embracing love. It is a state that can only be entered into by rising above one's lower self. It is, in fact, the submergence of the self in the non-self, the submission of passion and intellect to the supreme. It is the attitude of a human soul adoring its highest conception. Such humility takes you above all that is mean and poor in your nature, into the very presence of God, making you calm, strong, noble, self-reliant, and godlike. It is the wine of life to all aspiring souls. The soul that has not felt its power is dead. It may sound like a paradox, but it is nevertheless true. But the more humility you have, the more independence you have. But the seeming paradox will be made clear if we think for a moment of the lives of such teachers of humility as Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, J. 
Jacob Bomey, George Fox, and indeed of all the great religious reformers. These men walked erect because, yielding themselves up to the simplicity of humility, they walked with God. The humility that causes you to go, metaphorically speaking, on all fours is false and is as debasing and destructive as the real humility is elevating and strengthening. Why should we go amongst our fellows like cringing, fearful beasts, calling ourselves miserable sinners? Shall we ever rise above ignorance by doing so? Is it possible to rise by ceaselessly contemplating our absolute unworthiness? No, we can only rise by continually contemplating the highest, there may be much that is unworthy in your heart, but there is also a sacredness, a dignity, a divinity about it. Let us dwell upon that. Let us continually contemplate the goodness, the purity, and the essential beauty of human nature. Let us ceaselessly search for the divinity in our own souls, and, finding it through the door of humility, we shall then recognize the invisible God in all mankind. By doing so, we rise above the binding limitations of our selfish desires and enter the larger, healthier, holier life of love. Chapter 10 Spiritual Strength All things are holy to the holy mind. All uses are legitimate and pure all occupations blessed and sanctified, and every day a Sabbath. A clear and firm head must precede and accompany a clean and gentle heart. Without the first, the second is impossible, for the qualities of purity and gentleness can only be reached through a clear perception of right and wrong, and by the exercise of an irresistible will. The strength of a powerful animal, or of that animal force in you which enables you to gain victory over others by attack and resistance, is weakness compared with that quiet, patient, invincible will by which you overcome yourself, and tame to obedience, and train to the service of holy purpose, the savage passions of your nature. Every dog can bark and fight. And the foolish can rail, abuse, fence with hard words, and give way to fits of bad temper. These things are easy and natural to them, and require no effort and no strength. But you, now wise, put away all such nonsense and foolishness, and train yourself in self-control. Train yourself to act absolutely from fixed principles, and not from the fleeting impulses of an unstable nature. You who succeed in so training yourself are able to train others, in a small degree by precept, but largely and chiefly by practice, for example. For it is preeminently the prerogative of the wise to teach by their actions. The mockeries of Herod, the accusations of Thai people, and the fanatical persecutions of the priests all failed to draw from Jesus the word of complaint, bitterness, or self-defense. Such sublime acts of silence and self-control continue to reach for ages both individuals and nations with far greater power and effect than all the words and books uttered and written by the world's vast army of priests and learned commentators. To retaliate and fight belongs to the animal in you as it belongs to the beast of the forest but to refuse to be swayed from the practice of a divine principle by any external pressure, to stand firm and unalterable in truth and goodness alike, whilst being blamed and praised, this belongs to the divine in you and in the universe. To alter your conduct in order to please others or to avoid their criticism or misunderstanding can never lead to spiritual strength. That divine kindness which always accompanies spiritual understanding and strength is something very different from merely saying pleasant words, for pleasant words are not always true words, but consist in doing what is best for the eternal welfare of the other person or persons. The weak father, who is unfit to train children, 
only considers how he can escape trouble with his children. And so he skips over their acts of disobedience and selfishness and tries to please them. But the strong father, who considers the future character and the welfare of his children, knows how and when to administer the appropriate correction, fully understanding that the few minutes' discomfort caused by his rebuke may save his child from years of suffering as a result of loose living, which is fostered by parental neglect. The strong, kind, unselfish father, whose care is for his children's good and not for his own immediate comfort, knows not only how to be tender in affection, but tender in discipline, knows how to stretch out the strong and, to the child at the time, severe arm of restraint to save his little ones when they would ignorantly wander away in wrong paths. So the man or woman of spiritual strength cannot be merely a weak framer of smooth words, but a doer of right actions, an utterer of words that are vital and true, and, therefore, eternally kind. The spiritually weak recoil from right when it is brought, as it is by nature it must be brought, in opposition to his desires, and they embrace ignorance because it's pleasant. As one of the spiritually strong, you recoil from sin or ignorance, more especially when it's presented to you in a pleasant garb, and embrace right, even though by doing so you will bring upon yourself the discredit of those who are ignorant of divine principles and their beneficial application. As a man or woman of spiritual understanding, you are as unbending as a bar of steel where right is concerned. Knowing that right alone is good, you are as unresisting as water where your worldly self is concerned, knowing that self alone is ignorant or evil. Acting from imperishable principles and not from the fleeting desires of self, your actions partake of the imperishable nature of the principles from which they spring and continue to afford instruction and inspiration through unnumbered generations. It is always the fate of one who acts in this way to be misunderstood. The majority live in their desires and impulses, following them blindly as they are brought into operation by external stimuli, and do not understand what is meant by acting dispassionately from right and fixed principles with entire freedom from self-interest. Such men and women will necessarily misunderstand and misjudge you, the right-doer regarding you as cold and cruel in your unbending adherence to right, or as weak and cowardly in your quiet refusal to passionately defend yourself. You will, therefore, be accused of many things, but this will not cause you any suffering, nor will you be troubled or disturbed thereby, for the truth which you practice is the source of perpetual joy, and you will be at rest in the knowledge that there are those who will understand and follow that you are working for the ultimate good even of your accusers, and that by manifesting the truth in your daily actions, you are in the company of those divinely strong ones who are leading the world into ways of quietness and peace.